All right, I'm going to start uh, so we don't run too late. First, I want to introduce Steve. Um, and when I was writing about uh, Steve's introduction, it was so long, so I have to write it down. I couldn't remember it. Um, I introduced already Steve in the beginning um, as a person who's playing with the, all this equipment and the AV. And without him, really, this wouldn't have been done. So. I met Steve actually virtually during the COVID. Um, he is hosting um, something called uh, Ventilation Matters on YouTube. It was a big group of people there, most all of them here. Uh, I met them and started contributing uh, with them um, and learned about Steve's contribution to mechanical ventilation. So Steve is also was director of respiratory care during the time of the DRG, which I don't even know. When was that, Steve? Like in the 80s? Yep. 84. Um, he uh, developed many mechanical ventilators, actually. Uh, almost 15 ventilators he developed. Uh, new and uh, many monitoring techniques. Uh, you probably know mostly with the Puritan Bennett uh, doing the first waveform analysis, did a lot of technologies, uh, contributed with, uh, you know, all this famous uh, people, Magdi Yunus, Lotsky, Rochard, um, um, John Mancibo, um, and he also developed the acoustic monitoring for asthma patients. Now he's working with the Oxford University in developing a really cool new technology. Hopefully we're going to be approved by the FDA soon and we'll be able to talk about it maybe next year. He's also an expert of uh, uh, for F FDA, an expert with so many uh, helping a lot of people developing new technologies. Also, he's a martial art uh, expert in the in the past, so don't mess with him. And but he's a nice guy. All right, Steve, with that, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Be water, my friends. <laughs> uh, my master would have said, Bruce Lee, he shall on. So thank you. I'm here to speak on high flow oxygen therapy. It's uh, a technology that. Many of us uh, counted on during the pandemic. And here you see, thanks to David Wilm, I borrowed a simple setup of uh, high flow therapy. Many of us call this the fish on the stick uh, because of the humidifier, or some of us call it a pig on a stick. And uh, the high flow devices that are in use today are. Uh, very, very integrated. They coordinate flows to heating and they attempt to reduce condensate. This is my disclosures. Uh, I run a clinical research organization and I've uh, done uh, fluidics devices for mechanical ventilation. I work with Telesair on their FDA submission. Telesair is a uh, respiratory company. Uh, out of Irvine, California. And uh, of course, I was the founder of Event Medical, which made uh, about five or six ventilators. I work with uh, Oxford University, Wadham College, and transferring technology out of Oxford. And uh, we're working on a ventilator in injury lung monitor. Um, again, I uh, am a respiratory therapist by training. Uh, four years of physiology on top of that, and uh, and I've spent a lot of time focused on regulatory issues because I wanted to bring products to market. These are the objectives. I won't spend too much time on them. Uh, introduction to high flow oxygen therapy, definitions, indications for use. You will find that I will use regulatory terms in describing things. It's just in my nature. Uh, I want to um, emphasize something that I always uh, am impressed with Ross Freyburn emphasizing, which is the difference between ventilation and oxygenation. You'd be surprised how many clinicians I meet that don't understand what the drivers are for those two things, don't separate those two things. And uh, I think in some ways that's why we went down the path of ventilator-induced lung injury. We thought we were happy we had oximetry you know, come of age in the 90s, and we thought we knew what we were doing. Uh, 
uh, we really uh, still have a lot of learning. The uh, current recommendations from the societies I'm going to go through, and then I want to talk about matching flow uh, to the inspiratory drive. Uh, patients with hypoxic uh, respiratory failure have high inspiratory drives, and uh, with most of the devices capped at 60 liters per minute out in the field, I know that uh, we've heard stories during the pandemic of people uh, daisy chaining multiple units together to reach higher flows. I also am going to talk a little bit about humidity and then uh, get some questions and answers from the team. So this is all basic stuff. You guys, I know everyone here understands that. There's no need uh, really to go in detail here, but clearly supplemental oxygen saves lives. Uh, whether or not we know what it does for us, the, uh, the heart or the lungs, when they fail, we provide supplemental oxygen. When supplemental oxygen fails, uh, we usually look at putting patients into the ICU. There's a high level of mortality if we commit them to mechanical ventilation. 30 to 50 percent, uh, depending on uh, which literature you read. And uh, we know that it's not very good for the hospitals. Uh, they have to spend a lot of money. The intensive care unit is uh, an area of highest expenditure within acute care hospitals, and it's certainly not good for the patients. So in 2015, this article really set the stage uh, and set a foundation for the use of high flow oxygen. Uh, this was FRAT's study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and 310 patients, uh, actually out of 1,000, they ended up uh, uh, randomizing to 310 patients. And what they found was that at uh, uh, a survival rate at 90 days was much higher in the high flow uh, nasal cannula patients than in the conventional oxygen therapy and also in the NIV patients. And that uh, the high flow patients presented with 12 deaths, the conventional oxygen therapy patients, 18 and non-invasive, who actually also were put on high flow uh, in between their uh, their bouts of NIV uh, also presented with uh, a higher rate of death. The ventilator-free days at day 28 were significantly higher in the high flow group as compared to the conventional oxygen group and the NIV group. And I believe that this study essentially proclaimed uh, a high flow nasal cannula as a preferred therapy for patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure. One of my favorite articles, though, is uh, an article by Matthew Drake that goes through uh, a lot of the foundations of how high flow works. Uh, we know that the benefits of high flow are that we see improved oxygenation, that there's a decrease in anatomic dead space due to washing out of that dead space, that uh, because of that washout and some of the effects on respiratory rate and oxygenation, there's a decrease in the metabolic cost of breathing reduced carbon dioxide generation. Uh, generally speaking, we know there's a rule of thumb, uh, and the speaker after me, Dr. Nick Hill, will also, uh, uh, he, he has taught me that there is a rule of thumb for every 10 liters per minute. We tend to see about a centimeter of water in a, uh, a closed mouth breathing patient. Open mouth uh, flows of 60, we're looking at six pascal or centimeters of water with closed mouth and about three with uh, open mouth. And of course, that's rule of thumb. That has to do with the breathing rate and the uh, expiratory compliance or uh, elastance of the patient. And uh, the reconditioning of inspired gas also uh, is important. We're putting high flows through. Uh, those high flows uh, that are adequately humidified can result in improved patient compliance, uh, also have been associated with uh, improved mucos uh, mucociliary clearance, 
or at least the maintenance or homeostasis of mucociliary clearance. As many of you know, uh, medical air, medical gas is dry. It requires the addition of humidification, and we'll talk uh, a little bit about that. Again, superior comfort and uh, reduced uh, room air entrainment. I'm going to uh, talk more about the reduced room air entrainment with high flow. I think that's important, especially when we're using indices like PaO2 over FiO2 or the ROX index. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I will say that if you look at the FDA, um, the, the mod or the total product life cycle area, you're going to find that the indication, which is different than the intended use, the indication is to augment the breathing of spontaneously breathing patients suffering from respiratory distress or hypoxemia. So they've certainly recognized that it's uh, uh, respiratory distress or hypoxemia. I would say clinically, though, we're using high flow to treat hypoxemic respiratory failure where conventional oxygen therapy is failing. That's, a, a, I think, a simpler uh, indication. And uh, an intended use is the functional use of a, of a product uh, or a tool or a therapy. And again, the FDA would say that the intended use, the function of high flow, is to add moisture and warm gases uh, to administer a higher level of oxygenation to the patient. And again, what we would probably say as clinicians is that it's intended to provide higher inspiratory flows uh, of precise oxygen concentration. Now, notice I'm using the word oxygen concentration. I'm not using the word FiO2. We've, we've gotten lazy in our uh, devices by labeling things FiO2. In reality, they're not FiO2, they're oxygen concentration. Uh, clearly, in a closed system, you could say that, they're, uh, that those are uh, FiO2. But once we go to non-invasive ventilation, unless we're matching the flows, they really are not. So we had a nice discussion on Ventilation Matters, a great uh, uh, podcast that uh, Ross uh, talked a lot about the use of high flow during the pandemic. I'd recommend that you uh, take a look at that and we'll get you the, the links to that. So I'm not going to talk about recruitment. I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, PEEP, although we should think of PEEP in the way that it affects uh, mean airway pressure. So keeping things simple, we should always think that the drivers of oxygenation are oxygen concentration and mean airway pressure. Very, very different from the drivers of CO2 removal and ventilation. And we know from work done by David Dansker and a lot of UCSD physicians and uh, West Physiology that CO2 removal, uh, the drivers for that come from uh, convection and uh, more specifically uh, tidal volume movement, the piston uh, being along the diaphragm uh, moving in a convective way, uh, CO2 out of the lung. And it's important that we also understand when we're thinking of high flow uh, that the issues and the equations of basic work. Now we know the simple equation of work is force times distance. In respiratory, we're thinking of force being hectopascal or centimeters of water, basically pressure, and we're thinking of distance as tidal volume. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, we also should realize that that's just work. And when we apply frequency, that turns it into work rate. And, you know, I'm not going to get into power, the power equations. Uh, that's not the purpose of this talk, but it is high flow. So <clears throat> oxygenation drivers uh, are, are the point of oxygenation. My pet peeve, again, I already mentioned this. I couldn't wait for my slide. I had to jump ahead and tell everyone that oxygen concentration is not FiO2. In non-invasive modes uh, for oxygen concentration to equal FiO2, the device operator has to have a, a reasonable assessment of the patient's uh, inspiratory demand, and I would suggest that the flow set on the device uh, exceed the uh, patient's demand in order for FiO2 to be equal to oxygen concentration. 
and Brochard has talked a lot about that as well. If uh, peak flow is not exceeded, of course, we know there's room uh, air entrained and it dilutes the uh, FiO2. Again, if we're using indices like the PaO2 uh, over FiO2 and we are not matching the inspiratory demand, guess what? We are probably uh, more aggressive in thinking the patient is worse off than they are. You know, I'm going to use some simple numbers, but if we have a PaO2 of 100 and we have an FiO2 of 1, uh, we're looking at 100, right? But in reality, if we haven't matched that inspiratory demand and, and the real FiO2 is 80%, then they're probably doing better. They probably have a 125 ratio. Same thing with the ROCKS index. Uh, so I just caution us to make sure that we have the benefits of, uh, of, of high flow. And as you know, devices today are a little bit lower in their application of flow. Um, and it's very important that we apply flow and uh, consider the risks as well as the complications of that flow application. I've already covered the drivers of oxygenation. It's O2 concentration, mean airway pressure in a simple way. Of course, PEEP and, and uh, uh, recruitment is involved there as well. So <clears throat> I wrote a, uh, a paper and it was published in the uh, Journal of Mechanical Ventilation where I looked at the risks associated with higher flows being applied to patients. Uh, clearly, uh, there are complications as well, things like uh, patient discomfort at higher flows. But I would, uh, I would, I would tell you that uh, patients' discomfort over time can uh, be alleviated, and that discomfort is not a risk to the patient. A true risk to the patient um, could be considered uh, a delay in uh, intubation. Uh, when a patient might be failing, but of course, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, with higher flows, at least we, uh, as clinicians, uh, can can leave the unit, give the, uh, um, the, the care staff behind some guidance, uh, including clinical assessment, you know, watching the respiratory rate or, you know, nasal flaring, accessory muscles, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> another concern that we've heard from some clinicians is work of breathing. We've also heard it from regulators that, oh, high flow, you know, adds a work of breathing to the patient. And uh, I, I would uh, tend to disagree. I think the literature shows opposite. Um, and of course, some other risks in higher flows are the application of humidity therapy uh, it's important that we uh, realize that higher flows, also the water chambers, the places where we keep the water will be consumed at a higher rate and we should have devices that are capable of quickly alarming when those water uh, uh, chambers are, are uh, eliminated or are empty in water. In the other uh, consideration, just like NIV, is that uh, these higher flows will lead to higher pressures those higher pressures uh, would uh, exceed the esophageal opening pressure and that that uh, excess might lead to uh, uh, gastric insufflation, aspiration, et cetera. So in order to demonstrate that higher flows were not going to generate higher pressures, uh, or at least pressures that exceeded the 20 centimeter uh, level of uh, esophageal opening pressure, I created a anatomical model using the PF300 and uh, a TTL system, used a ventilator to drive a spontaneous breathing model, and looked at uh, uh, the effects of pressure on the intraoral space. Did it in four models, did it in active breathing, did it in passive breathing, created a lung collapse model, and also um, uh, used an open mouth methodology. In doing that, we were able to see that the highest pressure generated at 80 liters per minute was uh, six centimeters of water, and that was when the patient was actively breathing against the, uh, the uh, incoming flow of 80 liters per minute. And uh, again, uh, this was far below the worry of 20 centimeters of water uh, to open the esophagus. 
Now, I'm not saying that uh, patients don't have this risk, but the pressure levels are significantly less. Uh, Patrick Tan, uh, who isn't here today, but, but uh, out of Malaysia, had uh, asked me, what about the mouth breathers? What about the gulpers? And certainly the big gulpers are going to still continue to have that risk, probably whether we're delivering five centimeters of water or three centimeters of water. Um, so again, the risks of higher flows are desiccated secretions. Uh, that comes from not providing sufficient humidity. A greater consumption of water may result in exhaustion, so we have to have good alarm systems. Flows that are associated with higher airway pressures, they uh, uh, do generate higher airway pressures, but uh, far below the gastric insufficient level. And... Uh, uh, we didn't find that there was any increased risk of aspiration. The humidity standards that we should be aware of as clinicians are defined by the ISO, uh, the International Standards Organization. And for non-invasive patients, we should be delivering 12 milligrams per liter of humidity. That's because uh, we do not bypass the upper airway and the upper airway still participates. Uh, we are used to delivering 33 milligrams per liter uh, to the ventilator. That's, uh, again, uh, um, the standard of care that we'll see on something like an MR850 or other uh, uh, humidifiers. And um, there is a call in the literature lately. Uh, I think it's um, Professor Lelouch uh, for higher levels of uh, humidity uh, that are closer to the 30 centimeter, I'm sorry, 30 milligrams per liter uh, in non-invasive ventilation. Condensate is an important element, mostly in intubated patients or trach patients, probably not as big of an issue in a non-invasive patient. And um, when we look at then the growth of high flow, we see it now being used in a number of ways. Uh, if you look at the American Thoracic Society, the European Respiratory Society, or the Society of Critical Care Medicine, we see that uh, high flow is uh, grown in its application. It has strong recommendations, of course, dating back to the Pratt article for hypoxemic respiratory failure. We see uh, in the operating room in particular with uh, patients who have high risk, but uh, even in the ICU post-extubation, the use of high flow growing in that area. Uh, Post-operatively, also patients who have smoking history uh, or are obese or have cardiac problems, we see high flow growing in application in those areas. And another interesting application that we should be monitoring in the literature is peri-intubation. Uh, we know that the uh, CPR guidance documents now require that we um, pay attention to the adequacy of cardiac compression. And certainly the application of high flow allows uh, the first responders to do that. In summary, uh, high flow is an accepted therapy in the treatment of hypoxemic patients. Uh, there's lots of clinical applications throughout the continuum of care. And um, I think that we'll continue like any new tool or relatively new tool, we'll continue to see new applications and we should uh, be guarded in some ways, but also be open to the application in, in places where we clearly understand what the device is doing. So that's it. Um, thank you for your time. Any questions about uh, high flow or as uh, Ehab mentioned earlier, any questions about the martial arts are welcomed or any uh, questions about, uh, about mechanical ventilators. Uh, I, I am going to go back to uh, Ron Anderson's uh, question about even if you put your ventilator at zero PEEP, it's not going to be at zero PEEP. Uh, we need a level of PEEP to recognize triggering. We need a level of PEEP and a level of flow to overcome the resistance of the circuits. So even when you set zero, the manufacturers of ventilators are setting a little bit above that, at least two, two or three centimeters of water. So the question was about the use of uh, in pediatric area and uh, neonatal area of uh, 
uh, cannulas with larger diameters and their ability to transmit pressures and, and trigger. And I would say that we tend to learn a lot from the neonatal and pediatric uh, uh, care of, of patients. And a lot of times uh, we realize that we've gone off course. I think another area where we could go back and look at things is the basic, I know people will yell blasphemy, but the basic application of uh, square wave, if we knew what the right effective lung volume was and the right uh, 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 dead space, then we could apply the appropriate tidal volume and not uh, necessarily worry so much. In terms of uh, uh, high flow, yeah, there was a, uh, another part of that question was whether larger cannulas in the adult areas should be used, larger di diameters. I'll tell you that, again, it goes back to the manufacturer. And if the manufacturer offers you a cannula, then they have done the testing to assure that that cannula does two things. One, that it's capable of delivering uh, the appropriate flow. But secondly, that the alarms that you have in place, like disconnect or circuit occlusion, uh, that those actually work as well. So I think it's important to have larger cannula sizes. Of course, pressure is an issue, but uh, uh, I think we will see smarter cannulas, and I think we'll see uh, large bore cannulas as well. Okay, thank you. We're going to take a few minutes because we have Dr. Nick Hill waiting. We're going to convert our system to allow Dr. Hill to speak on non-invasive ventilation. So if you'll give us a few minutes. Thank you.